Magical girl shows have always been pretty popular, but in the wake of Minky Momo, the number of anime being made in that genre was absolutely legendary. You had Persia, you had Pastel Yumi, you had Magical Emmy, the magical star, but no anime ever rivaled Minky Momo like Creamy Mommy. Released in 1983, Creamy Mommy is the story of a regular girl abducted by a UFO and gifted magical powers by talking alien cats. Pretty standard magical girl stuff, really. Just like Minky Momo before her, she can transform into an adult version of herself, and the show follows her over the course of one year as she juggles her new life as a popular idol and her everyday life as a regular girl. If that sounds like a short description, that's because it is. Creamy Mommy is a light on story, and unlike modern anime, there's no huge plot going on with evil villains to fight. Most of the episodes of the show are fairly normal, and they range from slice of life stories to Creamy Mommy saving Japan from Godzilla. The show doesn't take itself too seriously, and neither should you. Much like Cypher, the series also got a couple of music videos, and MTV was at the height of its popularity at the time, so this was a lot more common than you would think. It's distinctly 1980s from its floating neon triangles to its aesthetic ending theme. And just in case you were wondering what the name of the show is, her family runs a crepe business called the Creamy Crepe. That's where the name Creamy Mommy comes from. Much like Minky Momo before her, Creamy Mommy was an absolute media blitz from every single direction that you could think of. Except this time, they cranked all that up to 11 by pushing idol records like never before. Relatively unknown at the time, Takako Oda voiced the main character, sung all of her own songs, and her show did so well, she eventually released 26 albums. So yeah, this business plan worked out for pretty much everybody involved. She sold so many records that almost every show in this genre started copying what Creamy Mommy did left and right, and you can see the influence that it had on modern anime even today. It even started to leak into live-action TV shows, and every once in a while you would have a show where an idol fights ninjas with rocket launchers just so they could sell more records. It got to a point where they started crossing over all of these magical girl shows for a number of OVAs just because there were so many of them, one of which has Pastel Yumi, Creamy Mommy, Persia, and Magical Emmy, the magical star, all fighting a giant tentacle monster in outer space. You know, it's probably better that you don't look that one up, but I swear, it's 100% true. None of that was enough, though. The people wanted more. It wasn't enough that they had Creamy Mommy fight a tentacle monster on the f***ing moon. Or that she teamed up with Minky Momo and wrecked an entire city. Not even the Creamy Mommy board game could sate their hunger for more episodes of this show. Even though the show ended up having over 50 episodes, the fans decided, to hell with all that, we'll just make our own damn anime with Blackjack and robots. So with nothing better to do, the fans drafted up a realistic, down-to-earth show that was completely off the wall and swarming with magic robots. Developed from the ground up as a series of fan comics, Pony Metal Ugaim, yes that is the name of the spin-off, was sold during fan conventions and ended up being pretty popular as far as unofficial mecha spin-offs go. Each volume would be filled with fan letters, fan art, and stories about this crazy mecha version of a magical girl show that everybody at the time wishes was a real thing. They even started selling custom garage kits at conventions based on this spin-off. And just to catch you guys up, garage kits were unofficial resin statues that you would hand sculpt oftentimes in your garage. And their popularity spread far and wide due to their ease of use and how cheap they were to make. They didn't always look all that good, but Pony Metal Ugaim was no exception. Now you would think turning an anime character into a robot was a once in a lifetime thing, but Japanese anime fans were nuts. They did this all the time. Kenichi Sonoda, creator of Riding Bean, Golf Force, Wannabes, and numerous other anime that you're probably familiar with if you watch this channel, actually got his start in these exact same fan circles, and while he was doing all those anime, he designed a robot version of Lum from Urusei Yatsura on the side just because he felt like it. Of these shows, Creamy Mommy is so well remembered that it actually has an official Twitter account, which is not something you would expect from a show that aired in 1983. The fans weren't done just making a fan comic and model kits though, not by a long shot, which brings us to the mystery of the day. Sometime in the last 10 years, a full three minute clip showed up on YouTube, basically out of nowhere, based on Creamy Mommy's mecha spin-off. 
but unlike doozy bots, the American version of Gundam, where they wanted to turn a kid in a wheelchair into the only Gundam without any legs, this was never meant to be a TV show, and it was never meant to be a movie, and it was never meant to be an OVA for that matter. And with all that out of the way, what does that leave us with? What was this? What are we looking at? Most places say that this was a pitch for an unmade TV show, but when you think about that just like really hard for a few minutes, that really makes absolutely no sense. Let's start with the name for one. Pony Metal u -Gaim. What does that even mean? What even is that? Well, anime fans in the 1980s actually made a t-shirt out of this mecha spinoff, and according to them, it stands for General Answeable Intelligent Machine. So she's kind of a robot. Kinda. In general. The anime Heavy Metal l -Gaim came out a few years prior, so they just changed the word heavy to pony, and then they swapped out one letter and they called it a day. Some people say that this is supposed to be a crossover between the two shows, but not even in the 1980s would somebody try to combine a mecha show with an unrelated magical girl show and then try to sell that idea to a rival company. The company Piero owned Creamy Mommy and Sunrise owned El Gaim, so if they tried, they would have been sued into the ground so fast their heads would spin. And I also think it's too well animated to be an 8mm fan short. Those were often done extremely cheaply, and most of them look like slideshows. They look straight out of Twinkle Nora Rock Me. And unlike the Daikon 3 shorts, it doesn't mention any anime convention anywhere in the short. So if it's too well made to be a fan short, and it wasn't made for some convention, and it definitely was not a pitch for an unproduced show, then what even is this? Why was this made? Well, I think I've got some pretty good ideas where this comes from and why it was put together. In one of the volumes of the fan manga, there is an entire chapter that lays out a story for the Creamy Mommy Mecha spin-off, and why is this an important thing? Well, on the very last page of that manga is a message with the tagline in plain English, To be continue, computer version. Aha! Now we're getting somewhere. We got fan comics, we got model kits, and now we got this. That means that this manga is surprisingly a prequel to a video game. But if this entire manga chapter was made just to advertise some game, then where is it? Up until now, there has been almost no supporting evidence to prove that this existed. But recently, someone uncovered some proof. What you're looking at are the only known photos of Creamy Mommy's mecha spin-off on the MSX2 computer. Info on this game is so unknown that it doesn't even have an article on the Lost Media Wiki. That is how undocumented this video game is. But how do we even know that this is connected to the anime, right? Well, in one of the screenshots, you can see this red fighter pilot character, and guess who shows up for a couple of seconds in the shorts? That's right, same character, BAM, confirmed. So if there was any doubt that this was a promotional short and not a pilot for some kind of weird mecha spin-off, well now you know. The whole thing was paid for by ASCII and an electronics company that teamed up with Microsoft to release the MSX computer series in Japan, and before the MSX came along, Japan was this lawless wasteland where every company just kind of made their own computers, and none of them had any sort of compatibility with one another. Then Bill Gates comes along and he goes, well why can't we just make one standard computer? You know, like a regular computer? And that way no matter which one you buy, they all kind of work with each other? Makes perfect sense now, right? But this was a brand new idea at the time, and it worked! The MSX sold over a million units. But why did the game get cancelled if these Japanese computers sold so well then, right? Japanese games got cancelled all the time, and many factors, both domestic and international, likely played a large part in it getting cancelled. Also, they spent all their money on a giant dinosaur statue. Let me tell you about the MSX Dinosaur Park. You're gonna love this. On December 1st, 1985, to celebrate their 1 millionth unit sold, the people at MSX made an incredibly bold decision. Really, really good stuff over going on over there in the 80s. Right in the middle of Tokyo, they built a giant, $1 million, life-size brontosaurus smack dab in the middle of the city. 
What do dinosaurs have to do with Japanese computers? Who cares? Giant dinosaur. Also, they made it roar every couple of minutes to really scare the ever-living life out of children. Most people say that this never happened and that it was just some fever dream by some person who still has nightmares about dinosaurs to this very day. But nope, this really happened. It was real. I have confirmed it. Unfortunately, there is zero footage of this event. And the only proof that it even exists is this article from a Japanese magazine. But can you imagine this? They actually commissioned the Godzilla people to build this thing. And at the time, it cost them a record 150 million yen. Yeah, adjusted for inflation, that's $1,646,243.90 US cents. That does not even count the cost of the event. That's just the statue. Bill Gates was reportedly so upset with this totally badass misuse of money that they scaled back all MSX development the following year. So that probably explains why the video game got cancelled. But what about the manga? Well, the final episode of Creamy Mommy came out in 1984, and interest in the series just kind of started to fade after that. Anime fans had other crazy ideas for things they wanted to do. As an example, they made a magical girl manga called Blaster Mari, where they introduced a magical girl into the Gundam universe for god knows what reason. The final volume of Creamy Mommy's spin-off would be released in 1988, closing out this crazy fan series with a text-only light novel as a thank you to all the Creamy Mommy fans out there. And as for where that short comes from, it just kind of showed up on YouTube one day, but I think I've got an answer that you guys are gonna like. You guys know Studio Gynax, right? The Gunbuster, the Evangelion people? Well, before they were Gynax, they teamed up with a company called General Products that helped them fund their Daikon shorts. And out of that store, they had a catalog that has an advertisement for this very three-minute anime VHS tape. We are talking the store where Prototype Gynax sold their merchandise here, so I strongly suspect that they sold almost no copies of this thing. I've never even seen an image of the box, let alone see one of these go up for auction, so who knows what it's worth? I have no idea. That's not all though. If the article that I'm looking at is true, a lot of extremely important people got their start working on this one three minute clip. One of which includes Hiroshi Osaka, who was co-founder of Studio Bones. Full Metal Alchemist? Escaflone? You ever hear a mob psycho? None of those would exist without Creamy Mommy. You can trace back every one of those TV series to a bunch of otaku who just wanted to turn a magical girl into a robot for some reason. So if someone ever tells you magical girl shows aren't important, well, you know, don't tell them because they won't care. But you'll know it's important, so that's really what counts, right? Now hang on, am I saying they actually animated a three minute anime, got some of the top talent in the industry to do it, wrote an entire backstory for this game, drew up a fan manga explaining the story, and at the time that they were doing all this, the game that they were promoting wasn't even finished. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying, and when people say Japan had too much money in the 1980s, this is exactly what they're talking about. They had million dollar dinosaur money, so there you go. Now if we could just figure out how doozy bots was a thing, I think I'll be able to sleep a little bit better at night. You'll love the doozy bots! If this is the first time that you've seen my channel, please consider leaving a like and maybe a comment to help YouTube push the video out to as many people as possible. And if you really like what I do, Kenny Lauderdale's Anime Museum and Discount Carpet Warehouse has helped made possible by support on Patreon. And if you want to see more of these crazy anime videos that I do about stuff that nobody else talks about, maybe subscribe. Maybe YouTube will let you know when I put out a new video. Or not, I really don't know what they're doing over there. But uh, definitely raises your chances of seeing when I'm going to do a new video. So maybe hit the button. It's just a button. Just hit it. Okay, well, I'll talk to you guys later. Thank you very much for watching the video, and I will see you guys later. Take care.